Summer's coming to Greenville, South Carolina. Soon I'll be wearing shorts, bright colored t-shirts, and my brown Allen Edmonds casual kicks, which are the sex. Wait a second. I don't have a casual bright watch to match the casual bright drip. How have I let this happen? So I open up a browser and start looking for a new watch and oh my goodness, there are so many watches, hundreds, thousands, millions of different designs and styles. How do I begin to even choose just one? If you've ever tried looking for a new watch, you know it's a monstrous time sink. While I'm scrolling through the hundreds of pages of watches, a nugget sized idea pops into my chipmunk sized brain. Do people still wear watches? Apparently, yes, because the Swiss watch industry just had its best year ever in 2021. The total export value of Swiss watches from 2021 was CHF 22.3 billion beating the previous all-time record of CHF 22.25 billion, which was set in 2014. But why? They're just devices that sit on your wrist and tell the time. Hi, my name's Yusuf and I question. Today I'm asking, are watches obsolete? Let's get this video ticking. A brief history of watches. Clocks exist, but they're stationary. How are you supposed to know what time it is when you're enjoying a sip of tea in the park? Thus, necessity dictated that the watch needed to be invented. Portable timepieces were made possible by the invention of the mainspring in the early 15th century. Nuremberg clockmaker Peter Henlin is often credited as the inventor of the watch. These types of watches were worn as pendants. Why don't we have pendants as watches today? Flavor Flav, he wears those ginormous clocks on his neck and they're cool. Pocket watches came next, but they were inconvenient. You have to pull it out of your pocket and open it up every time you want to check what time it is. There was a need a need for convenience. So convenient that a timekeeping device is sitting on your wrist. And the wristwatch was born. According to the Guinness World Records, the first watch was made in 1868 for Countess Kosawicz of Hungary by Swiss watchmaker Patek Philippe. Initially intended as a piece of jewelry, the creation of the wristwatch became a sought after accessory for both ornamental and functional purposes. The first wristwatches were worn by women and they were called wristlets. Mass adoption of watches didn't happen until World War I, where synchronizing time for military operations became important for the success of a mission. Thus, the trench watch was born. It goes on your wrist so you can keep your hands on your gun while checking the time. It it was big and easily readable. They put strong glass on the front so it wouldn't break during battle, and they infused it with radium so the numbers would glow at night. The watch descended down from the rich class as a piece of jewelry to a tool for soldiers on the battlefield. There was generally one style of watch for soldiers in World War I, but the world had changed immensely by the time World War II started. From trenches to tanks to planes to boats, new designs were created to fit the needs of soldiers. Like the German pilot watch, known as the Flieger. They have a large face size of sometimes 55 millimeters in diameter and minimal styling so pilots could at a glance see what time it is while they were flying. Field soldiers had much smaller watches with a face diameter size of 32 to 35 millimeters. American soldiers who battled in waters were given watches that had a crown cover and given the nickname Canteen because of the way it looks. The purpose? To make the watch waterproof proof. Soldiers who survived wars with their watches would keep them as a memento. And that could be where the idea of passing down your watch as an heirloom may have come from. The watch went from jewelry to tool and that's how it was for a very long time. Because watches were seen as a tool, they needed to be precise. But the funny thing is, mechanical watches were not really that precise and not really that convenient at the time. Story time! Be me! living my life to the age of 22 without a watch. I'm vacationing in Philadelphia, eating a different cheesesteak every single day and running up the rocky steps because I think I'm cool. I'm walking downtown and it's getting pretty hot outside, so I take a breather at Macy's downtown. I find myself in the watch section and discover Casio G-Shock. Rough digital watches for the rough person who goes on rough adventures. Basically, not me. I'm checking them out and I think some of the designs are cool, so I put some on. They're big, have way too much text on them, and they look outdated with the 80s calculator display look. But then I see one called the G-Shock Mudman. It has a little circle that shows the moon phase and my geek senses start tingling. It's 
big, but not as big as some of the other G-Shock models. And the strap feels pretty comfortable. I think about buying it, but then I decide not to. Later that night, when I'm chilling in my hotel room, I start thinking about the G-Shock again. So I Google it and discover there's a Japanese model of the same watch that has a feature called atomic timekeeping. It uses radio signals every night to synchronize the time. And that way, the watch will always be 100% accurate. So cool. I'm thinking it's going to cost a buck a load of money because all these features and because it's a Japanese model. But surprisingly, it only costs $200. I buy the watch, it arrives, and I love it. It's the ultimate, you don't have to think about it, it just works watch. It uses solar energy to charge the battery so you don't ever have to change it. The time is always perfect because it syncs up every night, even when it's daylight savings time. And it's got lots of other features that I never ever use. I wear it whenever I'm doing something sporty or when I want to go swimming or whenever I'm doing something casually. I've owned it for 10 years and have never had to charge it. It's pretty amazing. It's my first watch purchase, so that makes it special to me. The four types of watches. From World War I to the 1930s, all watches were hand-wind mechanical. In a manual watch, the wearer has to turn the crown, the winder, to tighten the mainspring. The watch should then work for roughly 40 hours prior to the next winding. In today's technological world, that would never fly, and it didn't even fly back then. Another thing to note about mechanical watches is the accuracy. A certified watch by Control Officiel Suisse du Chronometers will be accurate to a bare minimum of plus 6 to minus 4 seconds per day, and it will generally be accurate to plus minus 3 seconds per day. A non-certified watch, meanwhile, will typically be accurate to about plus minus 5 seconds per day, even plus minus 10 seconds per day is typically considered acceptable. Although in that case, you'll want to set your watch about once a week. You had to wind the watch every day and it may lose up to plus or minus 10 seconds. So you have to set the time every week for it to be accurate. That could be one reason why watches were not that popular. By the way, mechanical watch accuracies are still the same today. Even a $100,000 Rolex watch can lose or gain six to 10 seconds a day and it's completely acceptable. The everyday person doesn't want to wind their watches every day for it to work, so the automatic watch is invented. Fortis presented a world first for a mass-produced automatic wristwatch at the Basel Trade Fair in 1926 called the Hardwood Automatic. An automatic is a mechanical watch except it automatically winds itself. Automatic variants are powered instead by an oscillator which automatically winds the mainspring to power the watch. The oscillator can be thought of as a type of rotor that spins when the wearer moves the wrist. This means that the watch is powered entirely by kinetic energy. All you have to do to make the watch work is wear it. Easy. This leads to a lot more people buying watches and it entering into the mainstream. The third type of watch is the quartz watch introduced to the masses by the legendary Japanese company Seiko. Quartz movements are powered by a battery. They require no winding whatsoever. Batteries send electrical signals to a quartz crystal causing it to vibrate 32,768 times per second. These vibrations are then measured through a circuit and converted into singular electrical pulses, one pulse per second. Quartz watches are cheap to make, run on a battery that lasts three to five years, you don't have to wind them and are more accurate than automatic watches. It seems likely that even the humblest quartz wristwatch can maintain accurate time to within less than one second per day. That's when the floodgates open. People started buying watches because they could afford it. The watches would tell time accurately and you didn't have to wind or set the time when you haven't worn it for a couple days. The Swiss owned the watch industry up until this point, but when the Japanese arrived with their superior quartz movements, they almost tanked the entire Swiss watch industry. The quartz crisis was the upheaval in the watchmaking industry caused by the advent of quartz watches in the 1970s and early 1980s that largely replaced mechanical watches around the world. It caused a significant decline of the Swiss watchmaking industry, which chose to remain focused on traditional mechanical watches, while the majority of the world's watch production shifted to Asian companies such as Seiko, Citizen, and Casio in Japan, which embraced the new electronic 
electronic technology. Watches were Switzerland's third largest export and they had to get banks to bail them out or their bankruptcies could have tanked the economy of the country. Wild. So how did the Swiss survive? They pivoted the marketing of their watches from tools to items of luxury. In 1953, you could buy a Rolex Submariner for $150. Adjusting for inflation, that's $1,615 in 2021 dollars. In 1983, the standard stainless steel Submariner saw a major price increase, jumping from a couple hundred in the early 1970s to $1,325 just a decade later. That's $3,824 after adjusting for inflation. Today, the basic no-day Submariner Mariner is listed on the Rolex website for $8,950. From $1,615 in 1953 to $8,950 in 2022 for the same style of watch that does the same thing. That's a little more than five times more expensive. The last type of watch is the newest, the smartwatch. Smartwatches are basically a trimmed down version of a smartphone where you can easily access messages, calls, and apps on your wrist. Watch snobs detest these things and don't consider them watches at all. But regardless of how they feel, smartwatches have been decimating the real watch market. Apple shipped 30.7 million units worldwide of its smartwatch last year, compared to 21.1 million for all Swiss watch brands combined. Smartwatches have been the most innovative and disruptive things to happen in the watch industry since the mass adoption of quartz watches in the 70s and 80s. Story, Story time. time! Be me getting my first job in the United States working at Geico on the creative team. One of my eight brain cells went, hey, you know what would be cool? To commemorate this moment by buying a nice watch. An automatic dress watch, my first automatic. I begin my search and spend many endless nights looking for a gem. That's when I discover the brand Orient. They're a Japanese watch company that makes their own in-house movements, something that's surprisingly rare in the watch industry. And they're affordable. I find one that's hotter than a summer day. White face with a textured dial, blue hands, and it's titanium. Here it is, my Orient white face fancy dress watch. I love the look Looks and it does the job of telling time fantastically. It's lightweight because it's made from titanium. I changed the strap because the stock strap was atrocious looking and uncomfortable. This one has sapphire glass, the best material for watch faces because it's known to not scratch. And I know firsthand that it's legit. One day I'm walking down a hallway and someone opens the door to my left. The doorknob whacks the watch on my wrist straight onto the face and I even hear a loud chink sound. I think the watch is done for, but I look down and surprisingly, there was not a single scratch on it. So not only does it look sexy, it's also functional and I love it. Popular brands and styles. Let's talk about some, and I only mean some, of the most popular watch models and brands out there today. There's so many watches out there, so don't consider this as a comprehensive list. More like the watch brands that I know that are pretty well known by a lot of other people. One cannot talk about watches without mentioning the name Rolex, one of the most famous watch brands in existence. It's the brand that you hear in rap songs the most. Rolex has had 1,102 mentions in rap and rock anthems since the 1970s to 2018. They started making watches in 1905 in the United Kingdom. They moved to Switzerland after World War I. One could argue Rolex became popular because of one person, James Bond. You may wonder why does it matter what kind of watch a fictional character is wearing in a movie? Turns out it's a pretty huge deal when a watch is in a movie. And according to a lot of watch enthusiasts, it's one of the reasons often cited as to why the value of a watch goes up. The most famous Rolex model may be the previously mentioned Submariner. It's known as a dive watch, something you can dive with and keep track of how long you've been underwater with the rotating bezel. The question is, who's going diving with a $20,000 Rolex watch? Another famous Rolex is the Daytona, specifically the one worn by Paul Newman. It previously held the record for highest value watch sold at auction, $17.8 million. When you see someone wearing a Rolex watch, you know that they have a lot of money. It's a luxury item and it's known throughout the world 
as a status symbol. Arguably one of the most prestigious watch brands on the planet is Patek Philippe, and for good reason. They were established in 1839 and started out by making watches for European royalty. Today, their cheapest, or should I say least expensive model, starts at $21,000. And their design for a dress watch is copied by every watch manufacturer. It's called the Calatrava, and it was actually Patek's first automatic watch. Pretty much every watch brand has a watch that looks like this iconic design. It's the epitome of the dress watch design. Patek Philippe makes everything in-house, including their movements, and they use the highest quality materials on the planet. It's a classy brand for the very, very rich. Next up, we have what I call the gangsters of the watch industry, or maybe Yakuza is a better word, Seiko. They were founded in 1881, but don't let that big boomer energy fool you. They're all about innovation. They were the first to bring quartz to the masses, almost obliterating the Swiss watch industry in the 70s and 80s, which is what's called the quartz crisis. One of the best things about Seiko, they have a watch for every budget, from $100 all the way up to $10,000 and above. Other brands typically stay in their lane. Affordable, or expensive. Seiko covers the whole gamut. They have an offshoot brand that they called Grand Seiko and their watches start at $5,000. And those watches use an innovative mechanical movement. The second hand on Grand Seiko watches ticks smoother than butter because they combine mechanical and quartz technology in a fusion called spring drive. The result is accuracy of plus or minus one second a day, better than any automatic watch on the market. I respect Seiko as a brand because they innovate, disrupt, and appeal to whatever budget you have. When you think of space and a watch, you think of space watch. Wait, wait, no. You think of the Omega Speedmaster. It's a chronograph, meaning it has a stopwatch built into it, and it was originally built in the 50s for car racing. When NASA was launching its Apollo program, they needed a watch that could withstand the vacuum of space. They tested many watch brands through rigorous scientific testing. The brand that withstood the most abuse was Omega, so NASA chose it as the first space legal watch. They strapped Omega Speedmasters to the wrists and arms of NASA astronauts, and it was the first watch to set foot on the moon worn by Buzz Aldrin. You can buy one today starting at $5,350. You cannot deny the coolness factor of wearing the first space watch, the Omega Speedmaster. This brand thinks that every other watch company is square, so they make square watches. It's Cartier. The Cartier tank is a watch developed for soldiers in World War I and inspired by the first Renault tanks hence the name. Cartier is more of a jewelry brand nowadays, but the tank is actually one of the oldest watch designs that's still on sale today. You can buy one starting at $2,610. By the 1950s, watches were starting to get complex. They had new features and their dials were getting busy. That's when the German Bauhaus movement leisurely walks onto the scene. They were like, yo, or in German, yeah, you don't need all that junk on the dial. What you need is a clean and minimal design, which in essence is what the Bauhaus movement of design was all about, stripping things down to bare essentials. Junghans came out with the Max Bill watch in the 1960s, which comes from a clock that a Bauhaus designer Max Bill created in the 1950s. Movado has been around since the 1800s, but only started getting popular from the 1950s onward. Their design is pure minimalism, typically featuring a distinct round circle where the 12 o'clock numeral should go and watch hands. That's it. I find the design to be minimal and cool. One of the most well-known and newest Bauhaus inspired watch brands is Nomos. They opened shop in 1990 and came out with their well-known design, the Tangente, a personal favorite of mine. The design is surprisingly inspired by a clock design from the 1920s. Their watches start at $1,900. Let me introduce you to the watch company loved by people who play sports, the military, and streetwear enthusiasts, Casio G-Shock. Casio is a Japanese company that makes tons of electronic devices like calculators, musical instruments, and even watches. But in the 1980s, Casio engineer Kiko Ibe accidentally drops and breaks a pocket watch given to him by his father. This moment inspires him to create a watch that can withstand a fall from 10 meters, have a lifespan of at least 10 years, and have a water resistance of 10 bar. The name G-Shock comes from its shock-resistant design, which 
which protects the quartz timekeeping element in the watch. It was actually a pretty common problem with early quartz watches, where an electrical shock could fry the insides and render your watch useless. The first release is the DW5000C, a now iconic digital watch design. You'd think that all the features and the fancy at the time display would cost bucket loads of money, but it didn't. Brand new, it was only $50 or $144 in 2022 money. You can even buy the same design in the latest version of the model with the DW5600E 1V for around $70 brand new. And G-Shock has countless other models with different features specific to different types of people and what they're looking for. The Casio G-Shock is the world's first true buy it and never have to worry about it watch. It's accurate, it won't break, and it's priced so that anybody can buy it. For that, I respect G-Shock. At the height of the quartz crisis, the Swiss brand Swatch is birthed and they fully embrace the electronic hysteria. They're credited as the company that saved Swiss watchmaking from extinction. Their mantra is simple, make affordable plastic quartz watches for the masses. Their watches are fun, have tons of different designs, and they're easily affordable. You probably first saw a Swatch watch at a mall, which was part of their marketing strategy to have their own stores and malls throughout the world. Swatch is all about fashion, fun, and style, not heritage or other snobby stuff like that. That is what makes them successful. So successful that they make enough money to buy a huge number of Swiss watch companies like Omega, Hamilton, Tissot, Longines, Mido, and more. They even own ETA, a watch movement company that makes movement movements for all those companies and many more. They're seen as a Swiss watchmaking monopoly. One last brand I want to briefly mention is Audemars Piguet. In 1972, they gave a big L to round and square design watches when they came out with their octagonal face watch called the Royal Oak. It's been an influential design to say the least. Story, Story time. time! Be my younger brother. He's getting married. I want to give both him and his wife a special gift. During one of our nine hour long online gaming sessions, he brings up the fact that his wife doesn't even own a watch. Boom. I spent three weeks looking for watches that in some way match each other, like a his and her watch. I wanted to get my brother a watch like the G-Shock, something he can put on and doesn't have to think about it. But G-Shock watches are not really dressy to say the least. That's when I discovered that Casio has a line called Edifice, but personally I find their designs kind of busy and a little on the gaudy side. While I'm looking at their Edifice watches, I discovered that Casio has a high-end luxury line called Oceanus. It has one of the best features from G-Shock watches, atomic timekeeping, where it syncs with the radio signal every night to keep the time perfect. I find a great looking Oceanus watch with amazing features. It's titanium, so it's lightweight, and the glass on the front is made of sapphire, the strongest type you can get for watches. Brothers watch down. Now onto the soon-to-be sister-in-law's watch. I decide on getting her a classy dress watch from Mido, a Swiss brand. It's got a silver dial and sparkly gems. And it has one thing that the Oceanus also has, a Roman numeral 12. Yes, that's something that connects the two of them, black for him and white for her. I present them the watches at their wedding reception. And by presenting it to them, I mean I write them a poem called 12 that I recite to them in front of everybody. I will now share that poem with you. 12. Life is made of millions of colors, but every color starts with two, black and white. Like how every love story starts with two, Two souls meet, love blossoms, a new work of art takes form. Every moment a stroke, every moment a brush. Live your lives with care, laughter, and love. Cherish every hour, minute, second. The canvas will fill with warm colors and create your beautiful story. The story of a lifetime. They adore the poem and love the watches, and they still do today. My brother messaged me the other day telling me it's one of his everyday watches and he gets compliments on it all the time. Why wear a watch? This may seem obvious, but hey, here we go. It tells the time. It's useful to have the time a glance away on your wrist to make sure you're gonna make that appointment or event or dinner for military operations, for time in a lap around the field, for scientific purposes. The watch is a handy tool that's right on your wrist. 
or left. Watches have other features that simplify life, like showing the date. Some show the day of the week. GMT watches have a fourth hand that shows you the time in another part of the world. Useful for if you travel a lot or a family who live in another time zone like I do. Chronographs have stopwatches on them. Gray for timing how long your friend can hold their breath underwater or how long the lasagna has been in the oven. And now I know what I want to make for dinner tonight. <laughs> Dive watches have a rotating bezel that helps you keep track of how long you've been under. There's watches that show you what the moon phase is, even on mechanical watches, which I think is wild. Watches are cool. They combine engineering and art to make a remarkable and useful device. There's anywhere from 100 to 1,000 parts in a mechanical watch, all to tell you how late you are to a date. It takes many skilled engineers and designers to create a cohesive, beautiful watch. Watches make my nerd senses tingle and I like that. While most watch brands stick to classic designs, there are a handful that are doing things that make my jaw drop. One example is the Resonance Type 3B that uses oil and magnets to fully rotate the face of the watch. I won't be getting one because it costs $36,000, but oh my goodness, it is super cool. Innovation happens in timekeeping, but it's rare. So when it does happen, it's special. It's fun to keep up with all the latest trends and designs from different companies. This is subjective, but watches are stylish. The type of watch you wear can make you look fancy, cool, sporty, badass, or however you want to be. For lots of people, a watch is the only accessory that they wear. Watches can be a form of expression. Who are you? What do you like? How do you want people to see you? That's important to some people. How the watch industry influences you. The buzzwords watch companies use to sell you on their glorified timekeeping devices makes me laugh. Unique, timeless, rich heritage, innovation, history, homage, iconic craftsmanship. These are some of the most overused words used by watch brands like Rolex, Omega, and so many more. These watch buzzwords are on their websites, in advertisements, and in all of their videos. Watch influencer channels on YouTube like Hodinkee, Teddy Baldazar, and Watchfinder & Co. parrot these words ad nauseum in their videos. Side note, Hodinkee and Teddy Baldazar sell watches, while Watchfinder & Co. is a used watch marketplace. They have a monetary incentive to to sell you on watches and their videos should be seen as advertisements. Their reviews are top-notch in terms of quality and they don't pull any punches. They really do love watches, but it is something that you should keep in mind when you watch their videos. As much as watch brands want you to think that you're buying a unique timepiece, the truth is that watch brands are owned by conglomerates. Many watch brands use the same movements throughout all the watches within their brands. For example, Swatch Group owns Swatch, Omega, Longines, Hamilton, Tissot, Mido, and more. Rikma owns Cartier, IWC, Jaeger, Le Coltier, Elongson, Piaget, and more. Seiko owns Seiko, Grand Seiko, Credor, and Orient. Citizen owns Citizen, Frederic Constant, and Bulova, and so on and so forth. While Rolex, Patek Philippe, Nomos, and Breitling have amazingly remained independent, it isn't the norm. Even independent brands use movements from two of the largest watch movement makers in the world. The Swiss brand Eta, owned by Swatch, and the Japanese brand and Miyota owned by Citizen. One example is with Laco watches. I love the minimalist design of Flieger watches, so I was looking at getting the Laco 42 Augsburg. On the website, it says the movement is a Laco 21, and I'm thinking, oh cool, even though the watch is only $410, they make their own movements for it. Neato, but if you scroll down a little further, you'll see under Laco 21, it says the movement is actually a Miyota 821A. That's a Japanese movement, but on the front of the watch, it says made in Germany. How is that transparent? If your automatic watch is from $50 to $5,000, it most likely has an Eta or Miyota movement. To be fair, there's a range of movement prices, from inexpensive to very expensive, but I struggle to see what you're getting with a more expensive movement. People say they're more reliable or nicer to look at when you have an exhibition case back, which means that there's a glass on the back so you can see the movement working. Some have more jewels, which helps reduce friction inside of the movement, which could potentially mean that the watch lasts longer, while others say that it improves the accuracy of the timekeeping movement. Brands that use in-house movements are really rare, 
when the watch costs less than $3,000. Going back to the Laco watch, it has a Japanese movement but says made in Germany on the face of the watch. Where a watch is quote unquote made is opaque. It's hard to find stats for German made watches, but Switzerland has a federal law on labeling something as Swiss made. To carry the Swiss made stamp, a watch will have to meet the requirement of 60% minimum Swiss value. 60% of the materials in your watch have to be of Swiss origin before you can put Swiss made on it. But the American Federal Trade Commission doesn't agree. A new watch company, Shinola, was founded in 2011. And the main selling point of the brand is that their watches are proudly made in Detroit. But they actually weren't made in Detroit. They were assembled in Detroit. There's a difference between made and assembled. They used parts from Japan, Switzerland, and China. The FTC sent Shinola a letter in 2016 saying they had to stop using made in Detroit in their advertising and on their products. Side note, Shinola opened a new store in 2016 on 14th Street in Washington, DC, and I went to it. They had display cases full of watches. You pick your face, then you walk over to the wall of watch straps to choose from. The experience is cool and the watches look spectacular. I love the minimal designs and the case finishing on their watches are very, very good. But their quartz watches start at $550 and their automatics start at $1,100, a little over my budget for watches. There's no official rule in the United States as to how much of a percentage of a watch needs to be originated in the country, but today there are no American brands that make watches at scale that can claim that they are made in the USA. While we're on the topic of overpriced watches, we have to talk about fashion watches. Fashion watches is a derogatory term for any watch made from a brand that is mostly known for selling other types of fashion accessories or clothes or aims to sell rather cheap timepieces at a higher than average price. Michael Kors, Tommy Hilfiger, Gucci, Kenneth Cole, Fossil, Skagen, Movement, etc. Major fashion brands license their brand name to put on cheap watches that are typically made overseas. They're made using cheap parts and are usually sold for cheap too. Watch enthusiasts despise these timepieces because they lack the buzzwords that other brands have like rich heritage, uniqueness, and craftsmanship. I think they need to dislodge their heads out of their own booties. Why make fun of what people like and own? I just don't get it. Watch brands do have have higher quality craftsmanship and history. But do you really think a $10,000 Rolex costs $10,000 to make? You're buying a Rolex for the brand name. And that's exactly what fashion brands do with watches. They're capitalizing on the brand recognition by putting their name on cheaper watches and selling it at a cheaper price so everybody can afford it. Their watches are stylish and because they're quartz watches, they're objectively more accurate than any $50,000 automatic Patek Philippe will ever be. As long as you're aware of how the watch is made and you're buying it for the style, get what you want and be happy. I'll never judge you for that. Wanna buy a watch as an investment? Think twice before spending your hard-earned cash. You often hear people saying that it's worth buying a $10,000 or $100,000 watch because it's an investment. The watch will go up in value. The truth is 90% of all watches lose value. The ones you hear that do appreciate rather than depreciate fall into the following categories. One, it was a family heirloom of a watch from 50 plus years ago where way less watches were made and the owner has the original boxes, papers, and more. Two, it was a limited edition watch that you have to get on a waiting list for years to be able to purchase it at list price. If they do ever go on sale, they're bought by bots within seconds of being listed, then stored in warehouses to create artificial scarcity. Three, pure luck. Sometimes an unpopular watch will be discontinued and because you're one of the 100 people who bought it, years later it becomes valuable. To put it basically, supply and demand and no one can predict the market. The funny thing about all of this is that I have actually bought a watch for my dad that has appreciated. <laughs> Story, Story time. time! Be me in 2016. I want to buy my father a gift to tell him how much I appreciate him for raising me, for helping me in tough times for being my father. I've seen my dad wearing watches growing up, but I don't distinctively remember a specific one. So I say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna buy him a really nice watch. That way, whenever he looks at his wrist, he can remember me, his bastard of a son. It has to be an automatic, it has to be classy, but something he can wear every day, 
and it has to fit in my budget of $1,000 or less. After weeks of intense research and narrowing down thousands of options, I find a gem, the Seiko Alpinist Sarb 017. These watch names really roll off the tongue, right? It's a beloved watch in the watch community because of its unique green dial, gold Mercedes hands, and gold numerals. Classy looking, but still an everyday watch. The colors have symbolism that's close to my father's heart, so I buy it. I also write a note to go along with the watch that takes me two weeks to write. It's super personal, so I don't want to read it in this video. If you want to see it though, I'm going to post it in my Kofi, a Patreon alternative. Subscribers to my Kofi will be able to access it, so consider joining. I ship the watch to my dad and ask my mom to read the note after he opens the gift. And she tells me that he started crying while she was reading the note to him. That made me happy and I thought to myself, maybe I did a good job. Maybe. Every summer he comes to visit, I see the watch on his wrist and it makes me smile. The green dial is actually really beautiful in person and it shines. It suits him very, very well. Back to the watch going up in value. I bought it for $360 brand new, then Seiko discontinued it and now it goes for $1,000 brand new on eBay. That is what you call pure luck. But the value doesn't matter because as a present to my father, the watch is priceless. My thoughts, I like watches, I really do, I like them. Art and science come together to create something practical, useful and nice looking. I can get behind someone buying a watch for an objective purpose, like for their job the work they're doing or the ability to tell time. When we enter the realm of subjectivity, like how good it looks and the brand name on it, it's all in the eye of the beholder. Personally, when it comes to subjective reasons, I have limits because if I don't put limits on these things, things can get really expensive really fast with watches. I've never bought a watch for myself that costs more than $200. And all of my watches have been practical, beautiful, or both. I wonder why people spend so much money on a device that sits on your wrist and tells the time. It makes me question if they're buying the watch for themselves or for others. Look at how beautiful my watch is. Look at my Rolex or my Patek Philippe. How many people buy watches to show off? We live in a world where there are watches that go for $1 million, like the Hublot Big Bang Turbion Croco. How about $2 million, like the Richard Mill RM5602 Sapphire? Not expensive enough? Then how about the Patek Philippe 19? 39 Platinum World Time that sells for $4.2 million. These watches may be for the ultra wealthy to flaunt their wealth, but you can scale this principle down. Why buy a watch for one, two, three, four, even $5,000? Okay, let's be fair here. More expensive watches are typically made with higher quality materials like higher quality steel or higher quality movements. But how much of it is because you care about the history of horology and how much of it is flaunting your wealth, trying to show your status through material objects. We are influenced by what we see, like when we see watches in movies. The most famous of all movie watches are the watches featured in James Bond movies. Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond, and Sean Connery, the first James Bond actor, were fans of Rolex watches. So the character of James Bond was written to have one, a classy timepiece for the spy who has a license to kill. But what started as innocent admiration has spiraled into watch companies bidding to have their watches placed into movies. And that's called advertising. Omega outbid Rolex to be featured in the 90s James Bond movie Goldeneye. And since that one, Bond has always worn an Omega watch. One watch company that was featured in a movie that I remember is Hamilton. Murph's watch in Interstellar is a key plot point and you clearly see see the Hamilton watch. Hamilton even has a section on their website called movie watches where you can see every watch that's ever been purchased. Oops, sorry. I mean featured in a movie including Murph's watch. Watch companies know how influential young minds are to seeing what our heroes are wearing. And we aspire to get those things because we love our heroes. But it's manufactured. It comes from wanting to make money, not from showing appreciation. Rappers rap about Rolex and Patek Philippe watches because they want to flex. The funny thing is some of the wealthiest people on the planet wear inexpensive watches. Bill Gates wears a Casio dive watch that you can buy on Amazon for around 50 
$50. Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, and Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, both wear an Apple Watch that you can buy for $400. Talking about Apple Watches, that brings me to a really good point. People spend thousands of dollars on mechanical watches that have a single look to them. But an Apple Watch can change faces and objectively tells time better than any mechanical watch because it will always be 100% accurate. Speaking of accuracy, mechanical watches are seen as luxury but a $100,000 Rolex watch objectively tells time less accurately than a $20 Casio digital quartz watch. It's hilarious. The less accurate movement costs more. Does anyone else find this strange? What I respect and love way more than any brand name is a good story. Like a coworker who wears a Timex Weekender because his dad bought him one as a graduation present. Or a friend who's wearing his grandfather's citizen watch that's been in the family for 50 years and was passed down to his father and now to him. That is special and wonderful. How about buying a watch to celebrate an important moment in your life? Like when I bought the Orient watch for my first big boy job. Or when I bought this Casio G-Shock when I was in Austria. It just came out and I really liked the blackout design. It has the Octagon thing going on like the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak. So I bought it to commemorate my trip in Austria and it was only 99 euros. I think tying your watch to an important moment in your life is really wonderful. Watch feel. Here's the one big thing that keeps me from spending a lot of money on a wristwatch. Feel. You can't feel any difference between a $10 watch and a $1 million watch. Okay, okay, we have to put aside that some people get feelings just by looking at things. That's totally valid. What I'm talking about is that a human can't objectively feel any difference between cheap and expensive watches. I can best explain this through analogy. Take cars, for example. The engine, design, and performance of a $20,000 Honda Civic and a $55,000 Toyota Supra can be objectively felt. You can feel the difference in performance how much faster the Supra is, how much harder it turns, how much harder it brakes. The sound of the i6 engine compared to the Civic's VTEC four-cylinder. The Civic and Supra do the same thing. They're cars you can drive. They both have similar design elements like four wheels, windows, and a steering wheel. They both look distinctive enough where you can tell each other apart. But with watches, a lot of the times you can't say the same. The overwhelming majority of watch designs are copies with very little differences, if any at all. Seriously, watch designs are all the same and I'll show you right now. Here's six watches that I expertly photoshopped the brand name off. And that was easy to do because for some strange reason, every watch is photographed with the time showing 1010. Why that is, I have no idea and it's just another strange thing about the watch culture that's unexplained. Can you tell which watch is from which brand? Give me your best guesses in the comments. All the similarities of cars are comparable to watches. Where it doesn't compare is that with cars you can feel a difference and you can't feel any difference between watches. Actually you can feel more of a difference with the watch bands than you can with the watch itself. Steel, leather, silicone, or the people who ruin nice dress watches by putting ugly $10 NATO straps on them. That is the main reason why I cannot justify spending more money on a watch. There are no differences in how watches feel. I don't care what other people think of what I wear. I care if the watch tells time accurately and if it looks good and fits what I'm wearing at the time. Does it match the drip? I have bought watches for more than $200, but those were presents and gifts for family members never for myself. All of this leads me back to the start of this watch journey, buying a watch for the summer. Story time. It's summertime and I don't have a bright watch to fit my bright outfits. So after literally hundreds of hours of searching, I find this newer American company called Veyer. They're a micro brand and from everything I was reading about them, it seemed like they were what Shinola should have been from the start. A newer American brand who designs and assembles in America America as much as possible. I chose the Veyer C5 because of three reasons. The design reminds me of Nomos watches which I adore. Simple and clean. The watch has a quartz movement that's made in the United States. 
It's called the AmeriCourts. It has sapphire glass with anti-reflective coating on the inside and out, and it only costs $200. All of those things sound fantastic to me. There is a new brand challenging the status quo of current watch companies. It's a breath of fresh air in the watch industry. Instead of advertising buzzwords, they transparently show who they are and what they do. No fluff, all substance. I respect that and it makes me want to align myself with the brand. And I did that by buying one of their watches. I chose the blue face variation of the C5 because it's a fun, bright pop of color. And because it's quartz. Yes, I chose quartz on purpose. I don't want to worry about setting the time when I put it on like with an automatic and the accuracy is going to be wonderful for everyday wear. You owe it to yourself to check out there if you're looking to buy a new watch. I'm going to put their link down in the description. By the way, this isn't sponsored. I just really like there. But there, if you see this and you want to collab, hey, send me an email. Another brand that I found out about that's mostly made in America that's trying to do things differently is Weiss Watches. The owner hand assembles every single one of the watches and the quality looks phenomenal. Where else in the world of watches do you find the owner of the company hand assembling every watch? It's amazing. The thing is though, their watches are out of my budget. They start at $1,450. But if you compare it to the mass produced watches that sell for thousands or $10,000 or $100,000, I think I can confidently say that it may be well worth the money. Outro! Thank you so much for joining me in exploring the world of watches. Here's one last watch I couldn't find a good place to put somewhere else in the video. My Orient Indian numerals. My dad came to visit last year and he surprised my brother and I with matching watches. A very, very nice dressy Orient watch with a black face and Indian numerals. It's very unique in America and I always get comments on it from people who notice it. You may be wondering who notices watches. Watch nerds. <laughs> Those are the only people who ever notice or compliment my watches. I, for one, am so happy that I found Veyer and I don't have to look at any more watches. It's torture. It's honestly nauseating how many watches are out there. I don't want to come off as bashing others for their choices and watches. Buy what you want and love and appreciate others for doing the same, no matter the price. What are your thoughts on watches? Have any good stories? I would love to hear about them in the comments. If you want to support me in doing more videos that question I have a Ko-fi page, a Patreon alternative where you can subscribe to me or give me a one-time donation. I have a goal where if we reach $400 a month, I'll be donating half the amount to classrooms in need via donors choose every month. Plus, members get other awesome benefits that you can check out on the Ko-fi page. Thank you so much and have a timely day.